this is also very general <coughs> presentation, uh, like introduction, what uh, and how was research in uh, Central European, uh, Central European wound fields. Yeah, this is probably the ugliest map you can find on Wikipedia, and this is <laughs> Lusatian culture. Uh, but um, the interesting, of course, thing is that uh, what they, what these Unfis they have in common, because they covered the areas of completely different economic strategies, completely different communities. They have nothing in common, only the Unfils. So this is very interesting. And when we, when we look at these huge areas, we can see that what they have in common is cremation, of course, but it's prevailing. We all know examples, and we also have today a presentation about those who, in, who didn't want to cremate the dead. And we also, from Poland, we have some examples of mixed burials on one cemetery, of course, the same chronology. For some reasons, some people were cremated, some were not. So cremation is what, what they have in common. The other thing which is very remarkable for this, peri for this period is increasing number of both graves and large cemeteries. Um, and the next thing is common use of pottery, not the metals. We know that a lot of uh, cemeteries without metals. Large cemeteries uh, made by communities who are very skillful uh, metallurgists and they have a lot of uh, bronze deposits or uh, bronze, um, bronze objects on the settlements, but they don't put metals in the graves. So the Urnfis, what they have in common is use of rather of pottery. <laughs> of course, the pottery, it doesn't mean it must, must be urn. We have a lot of examples also of field graves without urns, but uh, pottery is somehow involved in funeral activities, which is also a very interesting question because in this part of Europe, pottery manufacturing is very seasonal activity. You cannot do it in the winter. You cannot do it when it's cold and when it's wet. So the issue of uh, combining the funeral activities and uh, use of pottery is also very, very interesting. About the cremation, what is uh, the main, to me, very, very interesting uh, thing is that it was quite, quite rapidly introduced. We know that in, uh, in Hungarian plain there are some places where the cremation is very, uh, is dominant the type of uh, funeral since the early Bronze Age, but this is like exception. But then, in uh, starting from, let's say, 1300 uh, 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 BC, in Central Europe, the, the crema cremation graves are completely dominant. But what is interesting that we can see some changes in the meaning of body and its, in it its, and its integration. And this, this, this didn't happen in the Undfields. What we see in the Undfields is the result of some changes that began before the Undfields. And probably the crucial period is the Tumuli cultures. Uh, however you can call it in different parts of Europe, of Europe, you can see the, the change from early Bronze Age tradition, which of course is the continuation of early Neolithic tradition in, the, in this um, side position. But then something happened to in, in treating the bo in body treatment in these Tumuli cultures, because as you can see, starting from this time, there's no way back. It, people never started to bury their dead as they did in the Neolithic and early Bronze Age. So this is the very interesting moment that people started to look at their dead completely different way. And what, what we see here is just a result of these uh, changes. And when we look at the number of graves, this is large cemetery in early Bronze Age. You have some, this is from Moravia and this is from near Rotten from my place. So yeah, this is kind of large uh, cemetery, but when we compare the numbers with the uh, Unfields, they are really very, very small. When we look at the Unfield periods, uh, first we have cemeteries that contain a lot of graves. And in the uh, Lusatian culture area, we have the estimations that there must can be, that there could have been <coughs> seven to eight thousand cementaries used over centuries, sometimes it's one thousand year old. Just imagine, I live. In, I come from the country that have 1,000 year history, 1,000 history. So when you think about such long uh, 
Um, so when you think about uh, cement is used for so long time, it's just uh, for us, modern pin is just incredible. But here you can make examples of some medium size uh, cementaries, but when we look at really big, these iconic sites, every archaeology student in Poland knows this, uh, this site, like Zbojewsko or Kiec. In Kiec there are like 6,000 graves, they are really very, very big and they were used for a thousand years. So there are very few situations that the grave um, uh, destroyed one or each other, so they they were very well marked on the on the surface. People just knew where to dig, not to destroy the the older graves. <coughs> and some recent excavation, this is famous site, very richly furnished graves from Domasław in in Poland, and there are like two hundred cremation graves, at, and chamber graves, and princely graves or almost princely graves. Very famous site. So the urn fields are important and stable elements of cultural landscape because if, we, if for hundreds of years people knew where the cemeteries are, here in the very center of the circle you can see the, mm. the green spot. This is just an example of micro region from, from Vicina in Western Poland. And in the center there is fortified settlement. And we have like in the session uh, we have like three papers about Vicina, so I won't just now talk about it. But the, the pink spots are cemeteries and the blue spots are open settlement. So, mm, these, uh, so these cemeteries were, were very uh, well rec were recognizable elements of, of the landscape for a long, long time. And uh, when we look at other, uh, uh, other uh, analysis, we can see, of course, the micro, this is called microecology, you know, I'm sure you know the notion. That, so when we have the vertical spatial analysis and try to find the order in, within the urn, there are some examples, this is publication by Alexander Gramsci, but there are many examples of that, with one conclusion that first there were some ideas about, usually we don't have the, the um, exact order, but to, Usually the, the urn is closed with, uh, uh, with skull, skull bones. And when you look at the reconstruction, you can see that the people, they started from the legs to the top. So what we find in urns that, uh, that uh, the, the, mm, the head was at the top of the, of the, of the urn. And also this type of uh, analysis can be done in non-invasive uh, way on the computer tomography when you can this was uh, applied mostly to uh, to to plan the uh, excavation strategy because as you know the bones are always very fragmented very fragile and it's very easy to to damage them during the excavation so uh, some measurements can be done on the computer uh, on the com on the computer and also you can know you, you know what you will find in the urn because you can find you can see some metal objects for example and then we have some uh, examples of spatial analysis horizontal and the grave level also very interesting issue to me because this is this is an example from Niederkaina the really huge uh, unfit from uh, Eastern Germany, published by mostly by Nebelzig in, uh, for, um, and, um, and his colleagues. And he showed in this picture that some of this, uh, some of these pots were, were secondary fired. And also this is a very interesting question, why, pe why some grey goods were cremated together with the dead and some were not. This is why we don't have bone and antler objects in uh, in uh, in this grave because when we have this mixed uh, mixed ritual um, sites when we have uh, information information graves we have a lot of uh, bone and antler objects but when it comes to cremation graves this is very difficult to find them among this and among the, among this uh, this burned bones and sometimes we have also very good examples from the, from the China site that we have. Uh, in some graves we have some fragments of bronze objects and in other graves we have just bronze lamps. So, but the weight is very much similar, so probably these bronze pins were burned together on the, on the cremation pyre. So the, this question is also very interesting. But of course in the Central European archaeology what we have, we have topology. This is uh, something you cannot escape from when you were born in Central Europe with, with, with this German archaeological tradition, which of course is good, it's really good to have things ordered, but this is not like the final 
uh, final aim of any archaeological uh, uh, work. But the typology also very very typical uh, procedure in working on uh, in working on uh, unfin material. It can be focused completely on archaeological evidence, but also combined <coughs> with uh, some anthropological. As you can see, you can typology of graves. Um, depending on the number of individuals buried in, in each uh, context. Also technological analysis, whatever you find, you can just test it. Or you, can, you can cut it and you can <laughs> check what it is. So that just examples of some objects clay from Moravichan site in, uh, in Moravia. But uh, of course, uh, now we have spectrum of possible analysis with uh, usware and uh, uh, and GCMS, as we have very, also very interesting uh, results recently in, in Urnfield pots. Some context studies. This is also very interesting because in, uh, uh, I, as an archaeological student, I was told that uh, staff grave was completely different from objects used in normal life. But uh, recent studies show, first thing, that most what we find in the graves was used before the position, was in normal has a normal life, normal biography, and also um, there are very few categories of objects which were uh, which were intended to be done to be made only to to funeral purposes. And here you can see some some studies on the forms. So so you can see that there are some forms they might be uh, intended to be used only in funeral context, and some were mostly for settlement. But these studies are also new in Central European archaeology, at least to what, about what I know. Also, we have some, um, uh, some special analysis on the level of whole cemetery, when you can see the colors are different chronology, but we, we can see some graves with some rest, uh, and plant rest, plant remains. So also interesting question that it's somehow combined with uh, the chronology. So there was a moment that for some reason, this plant was added to the graves. And also some constructions. You can see the red spots are chamber graves. <coughs> and of course, social and ritual issues, uh, which are very uh, rare in, in, in my opinion, because uh, there are, archaeologists are convinced, convinced that they are very difficult to study, which is true, but this is not an excuse. And uh, <laughs> uh, but we have also some uh, some indicators of possible possibly possibly elites, and I know the colleague from uh, from Balkans they can they, you speak about elite grave uh, about uh, in Slovenia or in Croatia. So do you ha you have set of, of indicators? Or yesterday I was doing a session about motherhood, and there was some about marginalization, and there was some list of social of uh, social indicators of higher status like some were interesting some were very intriguing like grave depth for example so i think i i think everybody has its own private list of what can be indicator of social status and also very interesting uh in my opinion very interesting interpretation about uh the, that the graves does the um, set of vessels we find in, in graves where somehow comparable can be comparable with what what is uh, called uh, um, reminds of some feast or libations when we look at these two pictures this is a grave inventory and this is a, a kind of feast remains which we find in the in the, in the settlement and there is a book unfortunately is only in polish when all these pots from the from one cemetery was measured and uh, the, there was a kind of analysis of how the, the, the inventories have changed over time, and it shows some different uh, some differences in in kind of feasting or, or making libations in prehistory. And also very interesting, like also published on the e Polish, so at least you will know it from me that uh, the the mm, the rapid uh, introduction of, of cremation is very heavily connected with uh, metallurgy. So the same. The fire is a crucial issue here because it trans the same way it transformed uh, metal objects, it transformed human bodies. 
Um, and this is uh, very interesting for, for me because we don't have any, uh, we, we have very few answers why the cremation uh, became so dominant in so rapidly in, in Europe. And showing the examples from modern India is definitely not enough because in Harappa culture, in Bronze Age culture, the cremation was introduced later in, than in, uh, in Urfield. So, um, it's not a good uh, example. And also we have some reconstructions of rituals. Usually the framework uh, is uh, connected with uh, rites of passage. And this is just an example from Gramsci again. When you, when you put archaeological evidence into this theoretical frame of rites of, uh, of passage. This is, of course, uh, these are the conclusions. So we have, I must say that Urnfield is really well we have a lot of excavated sites, a lot of published sites. The quality of the, of the publication is usually very, very good. But this is mostly descriptive. Uh, th there are mostly descriptions. You'd, it's not important if it's uh, data brought from, from GCMS. Again, you, what you have, you have data, but you have to work on this data. And uh, I think the proportion between data and interpretation are still not um, not enough to, what we have is not enough to, to know this very interesting, uh, interesting period. So this is it. Thank you.